And then eventually, uh, Bill Wilson, the father of AA, writes Jung a letter uh, in 1961 and says, you may not necessarily know this, but you know, you're the, you are the, one of the founding fathers and almost no one has had more influence on AA than you. Yeah, actually getting sober, um, you know, it was funny because I was like a Christian my entire life and uh, and I and I wanted to get sober, but I just didn't really like have a good reason to get sober, you know, other than it was like kind of like screwing my life up a little bit. But like, other than that, um, and it wasn't until I started like doing the Jordan Peterson binge, right? The, the clean your room binge. Um, and then, yeah, and then I found the, 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 the you stuff and then got sober, I think within like two months. Really? So, so that gave you a reason other than stop fucking your life up. So what was that? What was that? Reason? Well, what I would say it did was that it, 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 it provided like more, well, actually going into AA. So I went into AA, I went into the actual program. Right? So I didn't just like magically get sober. No, like I'm like, you know, went, went into AA and, um, and it works, man, you know, the, and so the program really works. And the crazy thing about the, the program is that, of course, it's designed by Carl Jung. I don't know if you know that. No, I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. Really? So AA, yeah, yeah, this is going to get you. So uh, in, um, and I'm going to murder this, and I'll bet there's some Jung fact checker out there. But look, man, I'm just a guy who stares at a cup. So, you know, screw yeah. off somewhere. Um, okay, so yeah, 19... 14 or something, Carl Jung starts having these conferences on, ooh, jargon, jargon, jargon. You know, the, the, our fearless leader always uh, makes us get rid of jargon, so I don't remember it half the time. The, the transcendental function, it's basically where you engage your right hemisphere through art. And you can either do it in like painting, sculpting drawing and you and it says you can do it with writing but it's like crazy hard so Jung talks about this a little bit in the red book um but anyway so so Jung builds these things on the 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 transcendental function transcendent function there it is so the transcendent function you know what I'm talking about uh sort of but uh, okay. pretend that I pretend that I don't uh, okay. Uh, okay. So the tra the transcend. So you're just trying to access the right hemisphere, artistic, you know, side of you. And so while you're doing that, and if you do that in a group context, uh, what you can actually do is you can actually exchange value systems a lot easier. So like if we all come to uh, the so the 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 idea for AA um, is that you all sit down. Everybody says, "Hi, my name is Drew, and I'm an alcoholic." Or, Hi, my name's so-and-so. And everyone always like gripes and like bitches and moans about this as though it's like the worst thing in the world. Like, oh my God, you know, I can't believe I'm doing, you know, saying I'm an alcoholic. Why do I have to say I'm an alcoholic every single time? Like, it's so dumb, dude. And it's like, it's the joy. It's the great joy, I think, of being an alcoholic. So, uh, and pardon me if I rant a little bit, but Merche Elliott. I think that's the point of this, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Merche <laughs> Elliott, who was like a famous anthropologist uh, guy in the uh, early teens, uh, 19, 1910, 1920, he was very much a contemporary of Freud. So, uh, so Elliott and this other anthropologist name is Victor Turner. They all get together and they all kind of come up with this philosophy. And one of those things is uh, in the study of shamanism in ancient cultures, they get to this idea of ritual humiliation, that all initiation processes begin with humiliation. And so you say, well, why do, why do, they, why do they start with humiliation? Hmm. You know, so the reason it starts with humiliation is because if I sit down in a room and I say, hi, my name is Drew, I'm an alcoholic. And the guy next to me says, hi, my name is Brian and I'm an alcoholic. And then the guy next to him says, I'm Matt and I'm an alcoholic. What we've all done at the end of everybody saying that is that everybody becomes equal to each other. And so I remember my second night being sober, this guy walks up to me and he's like, just uber rich, super like, you know, shredded, like 6% body fat, like just like 
you know, you can tell that he's like the, the alpha in the room. Like, no, there are no questions. There's like that guy. And then there's everybody else. And he comes up to me after on my, on my second day of being sober. Like, I mean, vodka, you can still smell it coming out of my pores kind of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he comes up to me, he says, how does it feel, man, to be, uh, to be the pinnacle, the pinnacle, the, 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 the top of AA? How does it feel? And I was like, dude, I've been sober for like 28 hours or something. And he's like, yeah, but did you drink today? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, there you go. You made it. Sober alcoholic. And from that moment, I believed him. And so when he sits down with 20 years of sobriety and millions of dollars, and I sit down with, you know, my little business and two days of sobriety, I feel equal to him. Because ritual humiliation brings people all to the same level. And now we can all exchange values. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you, need, you need to have humility if you're going to do any kind of work. So you show up to this thing. There's something you want to do. And if, you, and if you're not willing to um, sort of like break yourself in a sense, then, then how are you going to make any real changes or, or, or whatever? You know, yeah, humility is huge. The other side of that, too, is that like for the guys who've been sober for 20 years, it's good for them to come in and remember their first day of being sober. You know, that's that's just as valuable for them because they sit down and they're like, man, look at that. But for the grace of God, I'm still that guy right now. And so it's kind of like when Christians gather together to like take communion, right? Like you already became a Christian once, like, why do you got to do it again? Well, you, you remember the body and the blood and all that sort of stuff. So, so there's a, there's this idea of, you know, and I really look at communion like ritual humiliation. Like it's where we all get together and we all choose to remember, um, you know, the passion of the Christ, the movie, which is a tough movie to watch. Right. <laughs> I watched it on Easter. I had never seen the whole thing. I'd seen parts of it. And uh, how was yeah. that? I, I mean, I feel weird saying it was really good because it's kind of like watching this. <laughs> like, how was that snuff film? Like, oh, it was great. Yeah, it was relaxing. Um, I really like the amount of detail they put into his flesh wounds. Like just when you think they can't go any deeper, you know, they, they, they do. They, they, they do. I did. And I mean, and there was even stuff they left out too, frankly. Really? From, yeah. Believe it or not. Yikes. So. We're not going to go into it. It gets pretty gross, but you know, uh, like, so, so, okay. So back, back to Jung and AA. So these 1914 meetings that they were having, right. So they go in and then they, they, they are, they're getting people to access their right brain. Everybody is meeting and everybody is having all these really positive experiences. And so then 1926 or 20, yeah, 1926, this guy named Roland Hazard goes to Carl Jung. He says, man, I got this drinking problem. And Jung looks at him, and what, what Jung basically says is, uh, you have a spiritual problem, actually. But he can't say you have a spiritual problem, because if he says you have a spiritual problem, all of his like psychotherapist friends are going to be like, um, we don't believe in that anymore. Darwin kind of came, and Freud, like, we don't believe in that. So Jung, can you please chill out on the spiritual thing? Um, the conclusion Carl Jung came to is that the guy was drinking to experience low-grade spiritual highs. Like, mm. yeah, yeah, I've been right. there. Yeah. Right. Oh, totally. I mean, and I, and I, and I, in fact, like, it is like wife, that. I mean, it's, yeah. I'm just going to interject real quick. Yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, I, I drink far less now. I've never done the AA thing, but um, I mean, this past year with all the, the nonsense of the, of the world, you know, I did, I found myself kind of, you know, a little overindulging a little bit. And, and, and I've, thank God managed to taper it down. You know, I can still go out and have a couple of pints, but I'm not like getting wrecked anymore. And uh, something really interesting about, I guess my alcoholism, if you will, um, is sometimes I really liked the hangover. Like I'd wake up and, and, and the hangover didn't even really hurt so bad. It's just, it put, it was like a, an, another altered state. And then I would go about the world and like, it, and, I, and it was kind of spiritual in, in in a way like I would feel more relaxed and just kind of like uh like I'm just throwing myself down the stairs of, of life and and uh, I don't know it did feel spiritual it did it's very strange correct and yeah. and you know and different uh different alcohols change the change the whole experience right you know yeah that is that is definitely true I don't know why but it's true everyone knows it it's true 
like drink drink a bottle of tequila and see what happens versus you know a 12 pack <laughs> well i will tell you the answer to the, to well, the no, riddle of tequila. don't do that drew don't do that no i'm going to socrates the tequila for you and i'm going to ruin right. it i'm going to over explain tequila so you can never enjoy it ever again all right tequila I, I haven't is... had it in ages I, I, good it makes me uh it turns weird. me into a fucking beast that climbs trees and exposes himself and whatnot so <laughs> yeah was... well well, I'm glad that there's something out there to remind you you are a monkey still. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's for. Maybe, you know? I mean, so tequila is the only alcohol that's technically a stimulant. Okay, yeah. I, I've done the work. The, the empiric evidence is, uh, is there. Yeah. Can <laughs> you confirm. Can, you can you can Okay, or, uh, you can concur. confirm. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can concur as, uh, as well. Um, so... Okay, so Roland goes in there with these, the, Jung says, oh, you're having these low-grade spiritual experiences. What you need is to find, uh, maybe you should try going to church. That's kind of what he gets at. So, uh, so, Jung, so, so Roland goes to church, and then uh, 1934 runs around, and he joins this group called the Oxford Group. Not a lot of people know the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group basically is this like interim group that all of William James, like metaphysics, um, there was just a ton of this kind of literature being written in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, Emmett Fox, out of it, we have what's called neo-orthodoxy, which is where Christians come in and they say, look, if Jesus didn't say it, then I'm not talking about it. And they throw like Paul and Moses out the window and all that sort of stuff. I kind of fall into the neo-orthodox side of things. Never heard of that learning so much today keep going yeah we're having fun yeah. um so so the uh so then the all of so then roland hazard and meets this guy named uh meets this one guy who meets the founder of aa he joins the oxford group meets up with this doctor and then they form uh another group that's all based upon the oxford group principles which were based upon jung's principles from uh, the 1914 meetings. And then eventually uh, Bill Wilson, the father of AA writes Jung a letter uh, in 1961 and says, you may not necessarily know this, but you know, you're the, you are the, one of the founding fathers and almost no one has had more influence on AA than you. Um, confirming that, that this is actually real. Um, yeah, crazy stuff. So when I found out, so I'd already been doing the Jordan Peterson thing, right? That whole clean your room uh, thing, side of things. And then I started getting into AA. And then I found out that AA was basically just um, Carl Jung and like the Christian church mashed into one thing. And that's AA, which is pretty much the best church ever. Kurt Vonnegut said that the, the greatest gift that the 20th century gave the world was AA. It's a nice wow. sentiment. I think I want to go join now. Even it's though, fun. Uh, I don't know. I've been doing pretty good, but I guess I could always do better. Well, I mean, I love the program <laughs> personally. Like, um, you know, it's been, I, I would say that like more than anything. Well, so, so you go through the 12 steps, right? Uh, and the 12th step says, having had this spiritual awakening, we endeavor to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So the reward for working the steps, and a lot of people are like, oh, man, like, screw the steps. I can't believe I had to work these stupid steps. You know, I'm here because a judge ordered me to be here and blah, blah, blah. But what people don't realize is at the end of the 12 steps, there is an actual spiritual awakening that where where you basically wind up living on a better plane a higher plane of inspiration right and that's like a that's like a promise and the crazy part of it is that it is true if you sit down and go through the 12 steps you do have a spiritual experience and the, the harder you work at it the more you kind of like put into the program while you're doing it the the better the experience is this is this is wild i'm, I'm still I'm really impressed by relating drinking alcohol to to uh, sort of being like a 
a supplement or for for or, or try, trying to have like a spiritual experience and it's like totally the wrong way to do it but it'll it'll get you there and it'll take it does so work much. yeah it works but uh, you know it's like uh it's kind of faustian right you <laughs> What's Great, the price yeah. you're gonna, it's depleting your, your nutrients, it's creating a, a dependency. And then you're also getting all of these uh, imprints at the same time, you know, because you have this, this chemical and then there's uh, associations that are gonna be created. Like I have fun and then there's, uh, there's music and then you, you, know, you meet people and then you get laid and like all of this stuff. And then and it's all ritual, it's all ritual around it. So it's got like all of the components of like, uh, of a religion or, or, or being uh, in a cult. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, it, a, oh, sort of? oh, absolutely. Huh. I mean, I, like, I don't know about you, but like for me, even now, I, there's a few bars that if I walk into them, man, just the smell of like sticky bourbon on the floor, you know, or like the way that like a lime smells as it like slices the air when you, cause when you day drink, these are the things you get. You watch the, the waitresses and the, or the servers, the bartenders, like you watch them slicing limes or like the way that like um, clinking silverware get clinked together before the napkin wraps. And then you hear the tape when they tape it up. Like these are very specific smells and sights and sounds or the way that like winter light reflects off of the bar versus summer light. Cause winter light is this real kind of thin, very bright white light. It's not this like warm, dense summer light, you know? And, and like, that's the level that I love being at the bar. All right. Wow. You're like the most observant alcoholic ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so wait, no, no, no. No, so okay, so so Walden, right? I'm sure you know Walden, right? Some Thoreau. I found out later that he so he goes and spends like two and a half years at this lake. And I found out that he wrote Walden like nine years after his time at the lake. He did hmm. not write Walden at Walden. He wrote Walden after he was at Walden. And so I'm it's not that I'm a poetic alcoholic, it's that my memory for being in bars is that good <laughs> okay so when you when you stare at the cup <laughs> and you're transported the into the realm of, of memory and it's not abstract it's not words it's images and smells yeah and uh the visceral deep emotions and uh, all yeah. those things yeah well i'm divorced too so like i uh you know depending on what memory i go back to i'll remember you know some like hot chick walking into the bar and i'll remember taking my wedding ring off and hiding it and trying to hide the tan line you know like those are the kind of things you you remember now now, now this is important what would you use to hide the tan line Oh, uh, well, you'd probably put it in your pocket or you'd have it, you know, down or whatever. Hopefully you're in a dark room, dark area. You know, it's more like location and have your hand flat like this because none of your fingers will hold no pigment in your skin. Okay. So, all right. Now, now, you know, now we know. Now we know. Now we know. Uh, yeah. It's like, uh, like those people who drink a non-alcoholic beer and they get wasted. And then their spouse comes home and like, oh, have you been drinking? They're like, no, I've just been having alcoholic beer because the uh, malt covers up the scent of vodka. Yeah. I didn't know that trick either. Yeah, oh. I can. I can. Man, I can. I can. If you ever want to know how to hide uh, a problem, I mean, I'm your guy. <laughs> this is getting kind of getting kind of dark. Um well, that, well, that's part of the fun of AA, though, is that you sit down and the things that you laugh at in the program, that's one of the ways you know you're an alcoholic, is when you sit down and, like, you joke about this kind of stuff. And you're not joking about it. Of course, this is how you're dealing with the shame of having behaved this way. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's a shameful thing uh, to, to behave like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that when you're not with your group of friends, you don't all immediately joke about it but then the next day what we'll do is then then what somebody will send a text about some guy in a dui who kills somebody and they'll send a text message with that news article and they'll say hey man but for the grace of god and it's true because i can't even tell you how many times i drank and drove like like, like literally like un untold un unknown still unknown yeah sure um thank god i never got into the the day drinking i think that might be 
you know, anyone that's doing that, that you probably need to get to the AA. Yeah. Well, so, certainly. Well, my thought with day drinking is that, well, my thought with any drinking actually. So I've, I've had a, a few years. Yeah, I don't want to be like, well, uh, I see you. I'm good. Cause I never did that. No, it's fine. So, <laughs> so I, I've got, I've got a few set of criteria that are fairly harmless that I use when I, when I talk to people about this sort of stuff, because some people will ask me, some people don't, it's, you know, it's neither here nor there, but like, you know, my criteria for, for day drinking is that I always felt that the most dishonest alcoholic beverage in the world is the alcohol consumed at 1038 in the morning on a Tuesday. Nobody should ever be drinking at 1038 in the morning on a Tuesday. Like it's not Monday. So you can't like have like some like hair of the dog, you know, weekend thing. Like it's Tuesday. You should be fully working. Um, it's morning. You should be alert doing your deal. And so I used to love the idea that when I had a drink in my hand, I was not responsible. That was at the end of the day, that's what it came down to. If you have a drink in your hand, nobody can expect anything out of you. It's like the same reason why construction workers smoke. Like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? I'm having a cigarette. Why well, are you working? Well, yeah, but I'm having a smoke break. Like I didn't start smoking until I started working construction because that was the only way I could get a break. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, I smoke too. And uh, I've quit like a hundred times. I'm really good at quitting. I mean, I've got a lot of experience quitting, you know, done it, done it at least a hundred times. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I find the most difficult part about quitting is, is that if you're a smoker, you get an excuse to just kind of like go outside and fuck off for five minutes and it's like socially accepted, like, oh, yeah, that's what this guy has to go do. And this is OK. Now, if you didn't smoke and you were like, hey, I need to just go get some fresh air. People would be like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Exactly. You know, and then and then I would occasionally meet people like someone wants a cigarette or a lighter. And they're like, fuck, oh, you know, dude, no, 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 people. Cigarettes uh, outside of a bar is that's a ritual cult too. humility. It's a ritual humiliation. It's like, I know this is bad for me. You know, this is bad for you. And if I bum a cigarette from you. We're all going, and then it's, yeah, it's instantaneous because everybody stands in a circle smoking. All of a sudden, everybody is having a good time. Everybody is laughing because everybody knows that they all are degenerate in some sort of way wow. and don't give a shit. Yeah, I guess that's something to bond over, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ooh. It's an actual thing to bond over. So there's got to be something better. I think what keeps people from being able to quit alcohol and, and cigarettes and all the things is that because it replaces like a like a spiritual or like a social kind of thing you remove that and then what there's this void and that void's yeah. fucking terrifying it's terrifying and it's and it's a lot of things um like for people in aa one of the hardest parts about getting sober like that first few weeks when you get sober is what do you do with an extra six hours a day of time uh yeah face the fact that you've been wasting about that much time a day yeah well it's it's not just Ouch. the shame of wasting it but it's it's the sudden realization that it's four o'clock in the afternoon now what are you going to do because normally you drink from four to ten or four to eleven or whatever but now what you're just like there and it's like 5 30 and like now what and then it's seven o'clock <laughs> and you're like well now what like and it's a very hard thing to to do and what they've found is that a lot of people who are alcoholics are people with ADD, ADHD, um, because it's a way to get the brain to kind of calm down a little bit, right? So my thought on alcoholism is that for every drink you have, you are 10% less present. You're like 10% less you. So when you go to a bar, everybody's had five drinks. Everybody is 50% less them, which means that they are 50% more everyone else. Ah, okay, okay. So by the time you get to eight drinks, everybody is each other. You are all inside. You are one giant morass of unconscious avatars with their shadows wandering around. Now think about this. Where does alcohol come from? Is it not bug fuck so you got the yeast i mean isn't isn't like the fermentation process like a roman orgy like caligula or something you know <laughs> like a mass of just fucking and 
eating and pissing and then that yeah makes the... and it and it has to be spiked with sugar all the time yeah. otherwise the fermentation stops yeah yeast is the beast yeah, yeah. so and so so my my here's here's where i'm at if you prefer to be 80 percent less present you clearly don't like yourself <laughs> <laughs> and or are unwilling to get to know yourself the, the, the next thing that, I, that I'll ask people, and this is what I think is, this is the most, uh, this is the best indicator of whether or not uh, you think you might be an alcoholic. And it's this answer. Do you know when your next drink is? Hmm. If you know exactly when your next drink is, probably an alcoholic. Well, I don't know. So I guess I'm, I'm good. I am healed. I would... I would say that that's a, a good indicator. Well, because there's different kinds that's, of alcohol. So it's very impulsive. Yeah, I'm more of the, what, what, do, you, what do you call it? Is, it? is long distance drunk the, the term for it? Where like, I can very easily not have a drink for like two weeks. It's fine. But like when I do, it's like, it's like a job. It's like, okay, yeah, this, I'm going to do this to, to completion. It's very difficult for me to be like, okay, I'm gonna wind down with two pints, talk to some strangers and then be like, fuck off, I'm done. You know? Okay. Yeah, so that would be in the uh, like the binge, the binge drinking style, where like if you have one, one's not enough, and you know what, one's too many, and ten's not enough, right? Um, so if you drink that way, then yeah, that's that 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 would be in the alcoholic tendency style, 